Sisters and brothers, Amy Wilson Feltz here. I am the pastor of St. Paul's United Methodist Church in El Paso, Texas. Welcome to you on this beautiful August morning. Again, this is Amy Wilson Feltz. I am the pastor of St. Paul's United Methodist Church coming to you live from our beautiful sanctuary. Thank you so much for joining today. Please let us know when you have connected. I would love to say good morning. This is our virtual passing of the peace. If we were all in the sanctuary together, we would be greeting one another. And so this is a way that we can do that. I can say hello to you and you can also say hello to each other in the comment section. So feel free to let us know that you are here this morning. And as you are connecting, I would love to hear about phrases or prayers or verses that you repeat in your family or to yourself to help remind you of who you are and who God is. What are the things that you repeat? Esther, what are some things that you repeat to your grandchildren when you talk to them? Gail, what do you say to your family members? What are some things that you repeat to remind us of who we are and who God is? Because we're going to be talking about repetition in various ways today. As you are connecting, I want to remind you that we have a connect form that you can use to ask for more information about what is going on in the life of our community. And we also have our giving link, which will take you to our online giving site. And again, I know this can be a little awkward to talk about giving, but if we were in the sanctuary together, we would be passing the plate and celebrating the many things that God is doing in our midst as we pursue our mission to love God, follow Jesus, and serve others. So if you would like to give online, you're welcome to do that through our website. You can also do that through our mobile app. And again, you can find that on your smartphone to search for St. Paul's El Paso. You will see our logo. And then once you have that on your phone, you can access all the videos that we are producing, all of the content that is available. And you can also access that same online giving link to set up a one-time or recurring gift to support our mission. And we have been busy by the grace of God lately. We had a blood drive yesterday. We have our back to school drive through blessing coming up tomorrow. And we have some additional ways to connect and study together coming up in the next few weeks. And all of that is made possible through the faithful generosity and the spiritual practice of giving. So thank you for that. As you are connecting, I would love to hear from you. Good morning, Jen. Good morning, Leonard. Good morning, Cindy and Carolyn and David. David just had a birthday, so happy birthday to you. I would love to hear what are some things that you repeat in your family. For example, one of the things that we repeat in the Feltz household is what we call our mantra, and it goes like this. You are loved. You are worthy of belonging. And this is where we are safe. It's a good reminder when one of the kids is struggling with a tantrum or when Jason and I are losing our tempers, which can happen sometimes, uh, to remember that we are safe in our family and we love each other and we belong to each other. And we also share, of course, certain prayers and scripture verses. So I would love to hear from you, what are some things that keep you grounded in who you are and who God has created you to be. Yes, Esther, never give up. All things are possible through God. That's excellent. Good morning, Bob. We are glad that you are here. Good morning, Terry. Good morning, Pop. My dad is watching from Abilene, Texas. We're glad that you are with us today. Good morning, Clark and Anderson families. We are glad that you are here. It's going to be a great day uh, as we celebrate God's work in our community, and as we conclude our sermon series, the summer road trip, with this sermon that we're calling The Final Leg. And in this passage that we are studying this morning, Jesus repeats something really important to the disciples. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you have them with you, or if you're using an app on your phone, go to Matthew chapter 20. I will be reading verses 17 through 19. Good morning. My mom is with us as well. Good morning, mom. Matthew 20, verses 17 through 19. So you can read along with me 
or you can close your eyes and meditate as I share these words from the gospel this morning. Hear now the word of God. While Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside by themselves and said to them on the way, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests, the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and they will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will rise again. On the third day, he will rise again. In our tradition, we say, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight this morning, for you are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. As many of you know, Jason and I have three kids, ages five and under, and in this stage of life, repetition is the name of the game. It started early with routine. When Natalie came back into our home as a foster child at eight months old, Jason and I were expecting Augie. So we took the five months before Augie was to be born to set up a really healthy routine for Natalie. We're talking meal times and snack times and bed times and bath times and story times. And as she settled in to our peaceful home, we could just feel her anxiety, even at eight months old, melt away. And then Augie was born. So we worked really hard to keep Natalie on that healthy routine as we adjusted to having a newborn in the house, which was a first for us. And honestly, much of those several months of adjusting to having two kids under two are a blur to me. But I do remember the first night that the daily rhythms of the kids began to sink. Augie was about six months old. Both kids had been fed, they had been bathed, they were in their pajamas, and they were still awake. So I said to Jason, quick, grab a baby, <laughs> let's go to the nursery, to Natalie's room, and we can read a bedtime story together. So he picked up one baby and I picked up another, and we ran into the nursery, and Jason sat in the big rocking chair and put a child on each knee, and I handed him a book, and our nightly bedtime story routine was born. It was such a helpful thing in that season of life. And honestly, our rhythm at night still looks very similar with the older two. And Olivia is beginning to join in. She goes to bed a little bit earlier than they do. Uh, but we repeat our rituals every night to create a sense of safety and a sense of belonging and a sense of joy. And from that perspective, repetition is a godsend in this stage of life. Repetition also shows up in my needing to repeat myself over and over and over again about certain behaviors, especially such as Natalie, please sit down on the furniture. Augie, please use your inside voice. Both of you, please keep your hands to yourself. Why don't you sit on the other side of the room for a little bit? Please take that out of your mouth. That is not safe. Please pick that up and put it away. Put it where it goes. Please use gentle hands with each other. Let's use different words to express those emotions if we can. I think you understand where I'm going with all of this. Sometimes I feel frustrated at the need to repeat myself so often in this way. And sometimes I wonder to myself or even out loud, how many times am I going to have to say these things? Well, the truth is some things bear repeating and we ourselves don't always listen the first time, especially when we're learning a new skill or behavior or in times of high stress. And I wonder if that is part of the reason that Jesus foretold of his death and his resurrection three times in the gospel according to St. Matthew, today's reading included. See, we are going up to Jerusalem. Jesus says to his travel companions in verse 18, 
in chapter 20, where I will be handed over to the authorities. I will be sentenced to death. I will be mocked and flogged and crucified. But on the third day, I will be raised to life. It's a shocking statement to be sure, but this is not the first or even the second time that Jesus has shared this with his disciples. We left Jesus last week with his disciples in the region of Tyre and Sidon on the outskirts of Galilee. That was the most recent stop in our summer sermon series, summer road trip that we began four weeks ago. We started in Jerusalem, if you'll remember, we started in Jerusalem where Jesus called his traveling companions to follow him. And then they traveled up to Galilee for a wedding in Cana and time with his family in Capernaum. And then they traveled back to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. And then we traveled with them again back to Galilee where Jesus began teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing the people of every sickness and disease, even demon possession. And then from Galilee, we traveled to the region of Tyre and Sidon, as I just said, on the outskirts of Galilee, where Jesus and the disciples are approached by a Canaanite woman whose faith demonstrated that the new life and healing that Jesus offers is available to everyone. So that was our last stop. That last scene took place in Matthew chapter 15. And since then, Jesus has taken the disciples aside twice to tell them about his death and his resurrection. In chapter 16, we are told that Jesus begins to explain to the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem to suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He tells them he must be killed on the third day and then be raised to life. That's the passage, you may be familiar with it, where Peter says, no way, Jesus, this cannot happen to you. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for me will find it. That's Matthew chapter 16. And it's a pretty intense scene. And it's not at all clear that the disciples actually understand what Jesus is saying. So in the very next chapter, Jesus repeats himself saying, The Son of God is going to be delivered into the hands of people. They will kill me. And on the third day, I will rise again. That time, the text says, the disciples are filled with grief, and who could really blame them, right? But the journey was not over yet. In the next two chapters, Jesus continues to preach throughout Galilee, talking about the nature of the kingdom of God. Don't worry about who's the greatest, he says. Put others first. Take care of each other. Forgive each other. Honor your commitments. Nurture a childlike faith, but don't act childishly. Share what you have. Live generously for all of these things. All of these things bring the kingdom of God to earth. And that brings us to our passage for today in chapter 20 and the final leg of our sermon series, The Summer Road Trip, as Jesus repeats himself for the third time. You're going up to Jerusalem, he says. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be mistreated. I'm going to be brutally killed. But on the third day, I will live again. So we learned a few weeks ago that that phrase, up to Jerusalem, is often used regardless of the direction from which the travelers were coming. And that's because Jerusalem literally was 2,500 feet above sea level, so the journey was up at some point, regardless from which direction you started. But a journey to Jerusalem also symbolized a journey into the heavens, an ascension of sorts. So sisters and brothers, this is where we can begin to understand that Jesus is sharing this news with his friends, not to overwhelm them with grief, 
and with pain, but to point them toward hope. To point them toward hope. This is where the good news starts to overtake the bad news, as terrible as the bad news is. The passage that Jesus shares, these words of Jesus, is bookended with the promise of ascension and the promise of resurrection. And yes, tragedy is going to take place. Injustice and violence and death will take place in the middle. But the trajectory of this journey is upward. It's upward, up from the grave even. In fact, this message, this good news is so important, so life-changing, that Jesus is willing to repeat himself even if he gets frustrated at times with the disciples for being thick-headed, for being thick-headed. Yes, even Jesus is recorded as saying, how can you not yet understand? In other words, how many times am I going to have to say this? And like a good parent, Jesus continues to repeat himself, to say it anyway, because Jesus understands that when it comes to spiritual growth and development, repetition is a godsend. With patience, Jesus continues to tell the story in different ways, with his words and with his actions. For instance, he speaks of his betrayal as he is breaking bread with his friends, even with his betrayer in the upper room on that night when everything that he has foretold actually commences. On that Passover night, he foretells of his betrayal. And later, when his resurrection has taken place, just as he has predicted, he appears to his followers in the flesh. And when they still don't fully understand or recognize him, he walks with them. He talks with them. He eats with them. He shows them his hands and his side. With every gesture, with every word, Jesus is sharing the good news. In the kingdom of God, life springs forth from death. Sisters and brothers, no message that I know is worth repeating more than that. Honestly, this is what all of our spiritual practices are designed to do for us, all of them. I'm talking about prayer, silence and solitude, fasting, reading scripture, worshiping, serving, giving. All of these spiritual practices and more are designed to repeat the good news in our hearts as we access the power of the resurrection, the glorious power of the resurrection in our lives here and now. And this process of spiritual growth and development can be truly life-changing, but only if we are willing to grow, only if we are willing to do the work of putting one foot in front of the other in this walk of faith. So, so far, in our summer road trip, we have uncovered four travel tips for our spiritual journey to help us do just that. So to refresh our memories, I'm going to repeat those travel tips right now. And the first one is this. True, choose our travel companions wisely. Choose our travel companions wisely. The second one is be willing to be affected and moved to action by what we experience on the journey. Number three is go to the source of what we have heard and see for ourselves. And last week we learned to keep an open mind. That's number four, keep an open mind. And we've taken all of these travel tips from stories in which the people involved experience some growth and some healing because of the choices that they make to engage Jesus in this journey. Today is our last Sunday in this sermon series. It's the final leg of this particular trip. And our tip for today invites us to settle in for the long journey as we develop a good travel schedule. That's travel tip number five. Stick to a good travel schedule. Now, I know that can sound kind of boring, but I assure you it does not mean that we are not going to encounter some surprises and even some spontaneity at times in our journey. 
It doesn't mean that we won't need to adapt our plan as we go. What it does mean is that when we do encounter surprises or we find ourselves on uneasy footing or we even discover that we have veered off of the path in some way, we will have a framework to fall back upon to help keep us moving in a healthy direction in our spiritual journey. And in terms of spiritual development, this kind of travel schedule is called a rule of life. R-U-L-E, a rule of life. And I know that that sounds stuffy, but it's an ancient concept that was given to us by our early mothers and fathers in the faith as a tool and a guide for our own spiritual growth and development. So that term rule speaks not of restriction or punishment, but of schedule and structure of healthy boundaries and repetition. It is a practice of discipline, something for which the Methodists have known to be famous. It incorporates all of our spiritual practices. Once again, I'm talking about prayer and silence and solitude and fasting and reading scripture and worshiping and serving and giving, all of those ways that we draw closer to God and to each other. And a rule of life is a rhythm of life in that way that helps us repeat what we already know, but are sometimes is easy to forget in the midst of our busyness and the business and the challenges of life. And the, that good news is this, our God brings life from death. That's the good news that Jesus repeated each time that he foretold of his death and resurrection and it's the good news that we as children of God have heard, I hope, a thousand times. But we forget. In the midst of our discomfort and our sorrow and our grief and our fear and our daily responsibilities, sisters and brothers, we forget. So it bears repeating. Our God brings life from death. Our God brings life from death, from the death of Jesus from our own earthly death at some point, and from those daily deaths in our lives to the things that are not serving us well, the, the actions, the behaviors, even the attitudes. Our God brings life from death. Our God brings life from death, sisters and brothers, and the least that we can do is live in to that new life. And a healthy routine, a healthy rhythm, a healthy rule of life will help us do just that. A consistent repetition of spiritual practices will keep us moving on this journey, will help us to grow. And children of God of all ages need a healthy routine just as the little kids in our lives need bedtimes and bath times and meal times and prayer times, and play times, and bedtimes. Such a rhythm of life is a godsend wherever we are on our journey. So as we close out this series, I invite you all to join me in examining your own faith patterns, your own spiritual practices and rhythms of spiritual discipline, and ask ourselves the question, personally, how can we build or adjust our schedules to support ourselves in our own growth and development. The church provides many different tools to help you do just that, and you're all invited to participate in those. So I invite you to stay tuned for our weekly e-news this coming week and other regular forms of communication as we talk about additional tools that we can use to help us grow in our faith together. And it is my prayer that we will continue to walk this journey together, never tiring of repeating the good news of good new life. Never tiring of repeating the good news of good new life, because our God brings life from death. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. 
gracious and loving God, you have taught us so much and yet we have so much to learn. So thank you for the patience that you show us in repeating your message of love and of hope, of grace and of mercy, of forgiveness and reconciliation, of death and new life. Cultivate in us the patience and the self-discipline to repeat this message to ourselves and to others as we cultivate healthy rhythms of life and of faith. Give us the courage to let go of patterns of behavior that are not serving us well and replace them with the practices that will draw us closer to you and closer to each other. In Jesus' name we pray and repeat the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Again, thank you so much for taking part this morning in our worship service. And we will have some exciting news coming this week about different ways that we can connect. We will have a series of personal devotionals that will be available to you soon. And we're also going to launch a Bible study that you can interact with in different ways that will go with our next sermon series. The next series begins on August the 23rd. Next week, we will come together for a sermon about wisdom and knowledge as we pray for all of the students and the teachers and the families as we prepare for an unusual school year this year. So I hope to see you next week and, and we'll give you even more detail about the many ways that we can study together as we launch our next series. Again, it will begin on August the 23rd and we'll be focused on the book of First Peter. So stay tuned again for more information. And for now, again, I want to thank you for being here today, and I want to offer this blessing as we close. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you would abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of our God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer who loves us very much. Amen. Be at peace.